In this week where we talk about the presidency, I want to talk a little bit about what it takes to engage in credible bargaining. Whether you're bargaining with Congress over the budget, Iran over their nuclear weapons, or terrorists over the release of hostages, you need people to believe your promises, your warnings, your threats, and your assurances. In strategic games, promises are the equivalent of saying, if you make this choice, I will respond with a choice that you'll like, something that you wouldn't normally expect me to do. On the other hand, a threat in a strategic game is the inverse of a promise, where a promise amounts to saying, do what I want and I'll make things better for you than you would otherwise expect. A threat is the equivalent of saying, do what I want or I'll make things worse for you than you would otherwise expect. The problem with promises and threats is that if the conditions are triggered, you have to make good on them, and that can be costly to you. For example, if President Obama says to Syrian President Bashar al-Assad that the United States will intervene against him in the Syrian civil war if he continues to use chemical or if he ever uses chemical weapons, then President Obama has to make good on that threat when al-Assad in fact does use chemical weapons which he did. But getting involved in the Syria's civil war could be very costly for the United States in terms of dollars, of course, uh, in terms of potential lives lost of U.S. soldiers, but especially also in terms of its diplomatic relations with Europe and especially with Russia. If al-Assad knows this, then he might dismiss Obama's promise as cheap talk and use chemical weapons anyway, which he did. And so far, he was right. The United States has not intervened uh, too much in the Syrian civil war. Acquiring a reputation for cheap talk, as you might well imagine, is problematic. Nobody believes your promises or threats, even when you mean them. And by the way, promises you want to follow through on, promises you really want to follow through on, are assurances. And threats that you really want to follow through on are warnings. Now, from the point of view of the other player, since they don't know whether you really want to follow through on these promises, uh, they don't know whether your promises are in fact assurances and whether your threats are in fact warnings. Uh, all they know is what you said. So acquiring a reputation for making credible threats can be very powerful in strategic games, in part because it gives you the room to bluff sometimes, particularly when it comes to threats. There are times when you can make threats that you don't really have any intention of keeping, uh, but other people will behave the way you want to anyway because of the fear that you might end up keeping them. An example of a government that has acquired a pretty tough reputation uh, on the question of negotiating with terrorists is Israel. If an organization captures Israeli citizens and threatens to kill them if their political demands are not met, the state of Israel simply will not give in to their demands. Israel may try an armed assault to free the hostages, but they have a policy of not giving in to kidnapping demands, and it's a policy that they've kept to throughout the years. The Israeli government figures that since there will be nothing to gain from taking Israeli hostages because the Israeli government's not cooperating, terrorists will tend to stop taking Israeli hostages, and m lives of more Israelis will be saved in the long run because fewer will be exposed to dangerous hostage situations. Uh, perhaps what ends up happening is the terrorists take other citizens, citizens from other countries whose governments are either not credible in their promises not to negotiate with terrorists, or uh, do in fact negotiate with terrorists and um, have no problem with that policy. The data actually seems to back this up. Many fewer Israelis are taken as hostage than you would expect given their dangerous position in the world. So how do you create a reputation for credibility? Well, sometimes you're going to have to make good on your threats and promises, even when they're costly and you would kind of prefer not to. You might try to behave a little bit crazy, crazily, 
establishing a reputation for doing things that are not in your self-interest is one way to make people think that you might follow through on a promise even though it doesn't look like a following through on that promise is in your self-interest. So you, you might avenge every little slight against you. Uh, so, you know, every little sign of disrespect to the United States, uh, the United States may respond harshly, and if it does that, if it over responds, if you will, uh, then uh, it might acquire a reputation for doing things that are not its own self in its own self-interest, which can serve it uh, in the bargains that it really cares about. You can also tie your hands in various ways. An example of this is Colombia. Colombia has laws in the books that threaten prosecution of anyone found to be negotiating with kidnappers for a ransom. Kidnapping was a huge problem in Colombia for a long, long time, and uh, the Colombian government decided that uh, it really didn't want to give kidnappers an incentive to kidnap more people. Uh, one way to remove this incentive for kidnapping people is to prohibit the paying of ransoms, um, and uh, if you do that, uh, the idea is that kidnappers will do something else. Now, this uh, tying of your hands in advance is a kind of commitment. You're committing to not doing something, in this case not paying ransoms. And when the commitment is credible, that is to say when the kidnappers believe your commitment, then they're going to believe that it's in your self-interest to actually make good on your promise or threat. Another example of a credible promise in this case is an engagement ring. An engagement ring makes a promise of marriage something more than just cheap talk because the fiancé presumably has skin in the game now. If the fiancé spent $5,000 on an engagement ring uh, and decides not to marry the girl, then he's forfeited that $5,000. Uh, so in that sense, um, his promise to marry her is hopefully not cheap talk, at least if $5,000 is a meaningful sum of money to him. Generally speaking, the President of the United States has two ways to try and meet his objectives, deterrence and compellence. Deterrence is a threat to punish if the status quo is not maintained, and compellence is a promise to reward if the status quo is altered. And generally, de threats are better for deterrence, and promises tend to be better for compellence, uh, because you could imagine very well that if, um, uh, if you promise to reward someone for not doing something, then you keep on having to reward them as long as they don't do things. Uh, and that can get very expensive, whereas you only have to pay up once, uh, and you may not have to pay up at all if your threats are believed. An example might be um, the stationing of United States troops overseas, and maybe some of you are in fact troops that have been stationed overseas. In situations where the United States wants to signal that it is committed to defending an ally, it will often station troops in that country, even though those troops will never be enough to repel a serious invasion. So the troops that the United States kept in, the, in Germany during the Cold War and troops that the United States kept in South, keeps in South Korea, Japan, and even Taiwan, um, these troops are, generally speaking, not going to be enough uh, to stop the main threats involved. So the question becomes, why does the United States put these troops in harm's way? And it's a way of, of establishing a commitment. The job of those troops, speaking cynically, is to die bravely. Because everybody knows, and this includes the Chinese, the former Soviet Union, the North Koreans, and so on and so forth, that if several thousand US troops are massacred by whomever, let's say North Korea on the way to Seoul, which is the capital of South Korea, everyone knows that the US public will demand war. They will not let that affront stand. The North Koreans and the Chinese know this as well as anyone else. These troops are enough to deter North Korea from attacking South Korea, even though they don't really constitute a large enough force to stop a conventional attack. Uh, and they're also probably enough to pressure China into pressuring North Korea not to attack. So it's got that secondary benefit too, because um, again, if those troops uh, do come into harm's way and uh, end up uh, dying uh, in defense of South Korea, uh, the United States' public, the, the U.S. public's response will be pretty predictable.
Um, interestingly enough, in this particular strategic game, North Korea chooses the other strategy. Rather than tying its hands by putting troops on the border like the United States does, North Korea uh, chooses the strategy of appearing crazy uh, in order to make people wonder if they might not do some things that at the end of the day would seriously harm them, like starting a war with South Korea. And this kind of um, signaling Right? This appearance of being a little bit crazy gives them more leverage in negotiations because you're not sure if they're going to do what's in their self-interest every time. Now, the reason that most people, uh, particularly most international relations scholars and foreign policy analysts, think that North Korea is being irresponsible in this situation is that as the game progresses, as time goes by, the North Koreans actually have to do something crazy if they want their threats and promises to be credible. Of course, they can't do anything fatally crazy, but they have to behave crazily enough that people believe, people start wondering, mm, might they really actually do this thing that they're threatening to do? So we talked about tying our own hands. And, and again, stationing troops um, in allied countries, uh, even not very many troops, is a way of, for America to tie its own hands in advance. Um, but another way to tie your own hands is this requirement of Senate approval for treaties. Sometimes having the Senate behind you as a potential veto point for the president actually helps the president in negotiations. Isn't that crazy? Um, because the president can turn to a foreign diplomat and say, well, I would love to agree with, to these terms and these conditions that you've laid out, but the boys back home will never approve that. In effect, the president's saying, my hands are tied on this issue, so you'd better agree with me if you can, because there's no room for wiggle room. Effectively, this helps the United States get better deals, especially when the Senate is controlled by a different party, or if the president is negotiating a deal that might be unpopular with the American people. In both these cases, uh, being able to point to the Senate as a potential veto point is actually a bargaining strength. Who knew that a lack of flexibility could be a bargaining strength? Now, it's worth, knowing that tie, it's worth noting that tying your own hands, as you can well imagine, also sometimes backfires. Foreign dignitaries might just prefer to deal with leading senators uh, if that's the real, where the real power is. They might just end up bypassing the president. So you have to have rules in place for senators that they cannot meet with foreign dignitaries uh, if you want this game to work properly. Foreign dignitaries, uh, diplomats and foreign ministers and the like, uh, might just not want to pursue negotiations with the president if the president can't make credible promises at the end of the day because his promises, whatever he says, can be nullified by the Senate. Of course, this is the foreign power essentially uh, the foreign power essentially playing their own side of the game, knowing that the United States is set up such that the president's hands are somewhat tied when it comes to negotiating treaties. Now, nowhere has the study of threats, promises, and credible commitments been more vigorous uh, than in the Middle East, particularly in trying to broker a deal between Arabs and Israelis over the Palestinian question. Arab states want Palestinians to get their own state, uh, which is within lands occupied by Israel. Israel, through a series of wars, ended up creating a mass uh, over a million Palestinian refugees uh, that are currently in camps um, and living in e both Egypt and Jordan and Lebanon and Syria. Uh, so all these Palestinian refugees are outside what was their original land. Um, Israelis, on the other hand, want recognition of their right to exist, and of course they want no more attacks from Arab states. The problem is that in trying to reach a deal between both sides is that promises made by either side are simply not credible. If the Palestinians get their land back, then there's nothing the Israelis have that's really going to stop much more terrorism. Arab states and Palestinians might just decide to keep on going, either making more demands of Israel or just attacking again the way they did in 1967 and 1973 and 1948. If the Palestinians recognize Israel and truly stop attacking Israel, then there's very little incentive for the Israelis to ever give back the land. So the better the Palestinians behave, 
and the better Arab states behave with respect to Israel, the less Israel has an has a incentive to sit down to the negotiating table. In effect, we have a kind of game where as soon as one side keeps their side of the bargain, the other side automatically no longer wants to keep their side of the bargain. They automatically want to renege on their side of the deal. And that creates for a very unstable bargain, because even if ex ante, before the bargain is struck, both sides want to make a deal, once the one side gets what they want out of the deal, the other side has no incentive to keep their side of the deal, and so the deal breaks down, and so you see these cycles of conflict, uh, followed by peace negotiations, followed by breakdowns in peace negotiations, because I think both sides are quite well aware that the other side's promises just aren't that credible. All right, in conclusion. So we've seen that matters of foreign policy are also strategic games. The president needs to be able to make credible promises and threats to other countries. Uh, and sometimes that's going to mean that he wants his hands to be tied. Other times that's going to mean following through on costly threats or promises when he'd really rather not. And yet even at other times he might want to seem even a little bit unstable uh, in order to appear like he really might do something rash if he were provoked. This is not generally recommended, but it is a potentially viable strategy. Now, the Constitution mostly gives the United States president the ability to do all of these things in foreign policy. But like we said just in the previous slides, requiring Senate approval of treaties is a bit of a double-edged sword.